You may be seated. Good morning and welcome. My name is Mark Hausman. It's good to see you all again at our morning worship service. To those of you joining us for the first time, we're glad to have you worshiping with us today and extend an invitation to sign our guest book in the foyer. It just helps us get familiar with your names and to know you better. As well, a welcome to Ben Kais, who I believe is here. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming. He's going to be speaking briefly about Libri ministry today. And uh, just wanted to let you know if you're curious about knowing more, uh, a comprehensive overview about Trinity's ministry events and opportunities to serve, you can contact our secretary to receive the latest edition of Rooted Together, our weekly e-letter. There is also going to be information available today about the Young Life Banquet and Trinity Women's Retreat available to you in the foyer if you're interested in either of those. Well, it's so humbling to think that the all-powerful God of the universe made this promise to his children, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. What a blessing to know that in deepest distress, rivers of sorrow and flame, our God does not forsake us. And there is good reason to say God's word is a firm foundation for our faith. Today we'll be hearing from God's excellent word as Pastor David Smith will be preaching a sermon entitled, Rich and Poor, Together in the Kingdom of God. The same God who never leaves and never forsakes is bringing you this message today for your good and for his glory. You may follow along in the sermon outline that's printed in your bulletin. First, we have a couple of ministry moments. Susan Patterson is going to present to us the shoebox ministry for Operation Christmas Child. Good morning, everyone. So it's time to think about Christmas, even though we're wearing short sleeve shirts a lot of the time, but it's the time that we can be blessed by helping others um, through this Operation Christmas Child program. Operation Christmas Child is sponsored by Samaritan's Purse and used to share Christ's love all around the world at Christmas time. Trinity is going to be starting um, the Operation Christmas Child campaign today, and it's going to be running through November 12th, which is our collection day. In your bulletins, you each have gotten something that looks like this, and it's your how to pack a shoebox guide. So it tells you what to put in, what not to put in. Uh, if you're able to make a donation with your box um, for the help of uh, mailing it, uh, that's very helpful to them. So um, if you can, you can um, bring them in on November 12th, which is the collection date again. I can't stress that enough, November 12th. And um, if you're not going to be here at church that day, that's OK. There's a box outside in the foyer with a little bit of um, information and some more of these if you lose them and you need one, where you could put your box if you're not going to be here that day. And you can put it there up until November 18th. But after that day, then no more boxes will be accepted, only because I'm going to be bringing them all to the um, church that receives them. and and then we won't be able to take any more. So I, I hope that you can uh, participate in this ministry if you're able, and I thank you so much for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go to Geneva, Switzerland, uh, in the old part of the city is a granite monument, and on that monument are three prominent words. And those words are post tenebras lux. Uh, does anybody know? That's Latin. Uh, I'm just going to volunteer somebody at random. Ethan, what does that mean? <laughs> After darkness, light. Now, Ethan is not an expert in Latin. He's working, working on his Latin. Uh, but the reason he knows that is um, I had the opportunity 
to uh, go to the Ligonier National Conference, and it was the title of that conference was The Next 500 Years. And we talked about the relevance of the Reformation in family life, in church life, uh, in fabric of society. Uh, so I purchased the DVDs and my, my poor kids and wife, we've been watching them again. Uh, and the idea was to select uh, three lectures, uh, which uh, Pastor Smith and I, we worked on trying to figure out what was, it, three good lectures. Uh, and we're hoping that next Sunday uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon, we're gonna show these lectures in the fellowship hall. So we're hope, hoping that people will be interested in coming and hear them. I promised Steve Harlow that I would bake some uh, homemade chocolate chip cookies to motivate him to come. So. Uh, enjoy a cookie, watch a lecture. Um, there were so many wonderful speakers, uh, Alistair Begg, John MacArthur, Steve Lawson, uh, many others. Uh, so we think these lectures really uh, pin down the, the, the importance of the Reformation, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy them. I know my wife and kids are grateful that the 500th anniversary of the Reform Reformation only happens once every 500 years. <laughs> So uh, I hope you can make it next Sunday. Thank you. And that's not all. Since it is the 500th anniversary, um, we're having multiple events to celebrate that. And one of those events is this coming Saturday, which is the day before <laughs> Sunday, as happens. Um, uh, we're going to have the third Silence of the Stones. For those of you who haven't been to one of those before, it's an arts night that we host here. Um, it's split into two different parts. The first part takes place here in the sanctuary. Um, we're going to hear some thoughts on the ties between artists and reformers, some poetry read by some local poets, some music from a local musician. Uh, his name's Nathan Glenister. And something I'm especially excited about this year, uh, we're going to hear a dramatic presentation of the Book of Lamentations. Um, the second half of the evening, we'll find ourselves upstairs in the fellowship hall that will turn into a gallery. Um, and there we'll see some art by local artists, some of them who attend here at Trinity, others who don't. Um, and enjoy some food from our culinary artists. So I would invite you all to come. It's designed for everyone. If you're an artist, I hope that it will encourage you to create more. If you're not an artist, um, I hope that you'll be inspired by the work that you do see, that will draw you closer to, the God, closer to God and make you feel more connected to the kingdom work that he's doing here. Um, and I hope that we get some good conversations started on the reformative role art can play in the church. So again, that's this Saturday evening, that's October 28th at 7 p.m. here at the church. Um, there will be childcare for the first half of that. So bring your kids and then they can come join us in the gallery part after for the second half. Okay, that's that. And I guess we should stand for the call to worship. This morning that's taken from 1 Corinthians 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. The last enemy to be defeated is death. All praise we give, our great Redeemer lives. Oh uh -huh. 
Lord Jesus, because we have a blessed assurance that you have redeemed us, that you have saved us, that you live, we're able to experience the joy that comes from knowing that you're with us always. Um, that these present sufferings that are, are real, God, they, they weigh on us, they almost break us, they sometimes do break us, but you promise that you're with us and we believe that. We have an assurance that we are saved, that you love us, that you're alive. Thank you for that. Please bless the rest of the service to your glory. Be with us. Amen. Please greet one another with the love of Christ. Good to be in the house of the Lord, and uh, I want to introduce uh, Ben Kies, and come on up, Ben, and uh, some of you participated in the, in the springtime when we had our, uh, our special time of service called the Love Project. Some of you went out to Labrie in Southboro and uh, worked on a good project out there. I learned something at the 8 o'clock service I didn't know about the ministry of Labrie, it's not all study time. In fact, half the time they're splitting wood and doing other kind of things like that, uh, those that enroll in a semester. So uh, Ben is gonna share with you more about the ministry, so welcome to Thank Trinity, you, great to have you here. Good morning, can you hear me? Thanks. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, in Bolton. I uh, live and work just down the road in South Pro, so it's nice to be uh, coming to a local church that I've had connections with over the years. I used to come here when I was very young with my parents, and uh, because my children are enrolled in the Imago School, I'm, I'm, I'm here at this church every so often for picnics and lessons and carol services and all those kinds of things. But it's wonderful to be back. Thank you for having me. Uh, my wife is unfortunately out of town right now, but we uh, are workers at the Southboro Labrie. We co-direct that branch of Labrie, and uh, there's a, a staff of seven people. We call ourselves workers, and uh, two main buildings down in, down in Southboro. If you're driving north on 495 through Southboro and you look down to your right, there's this big white mansion there that's been there for a long, long time, and that's, that's where we live. Um, Labrie was is started in the 1950s by Francis and Edith Schaefer. They were Americans living in Switzerland, and uh, it really began organically with them offering hospitality to the friends of their children who were in university and having conversations with them about truth, about the Christian faith, uh, and it grew out of that. Um, today, uh, Labrie exists in eight countries. There's nine different branches, two in this country. And it's a study center and an intentional community. Those two things combined, study and community. One of the, the, the key things about Labrie is hospitality. So those of us who, who live there, it's our home. And the students that come stay with us, live with us, eat meals with us. Uh, we're open for a, a, basically a semester length of time, about, about three months. Um, that's what we call a term. People can come for the whole term, or they can come for a shorter amount of time if that works better for them. And uh, it's important to us that it, that it feels like a home to them. The, the name Labrie is a French word for shelter. And uh, it's important to us that Labrie doesn't just feel like an institution, but actually feels like a home to people when they're with us. And that's an important part of the ministry, is the hospitality side of it. Um, each person will study for half of the day. And we set up an individual study program with each person, depending on what their questions are. And we have a lot of flexibility because 
We're not a uh, accredited institution with a curriculum that everybody's working through. We really set up an individual plan for each person because people are coming with very different questions and things they want to think about. And then for the other half of the day, they work, like, like uh, David was saying. We, uh, we put people to work because we need the work done. <laughs> uh, it's not just for character building. Um, <laughs> but uh, although that happens too. <laughs> But very, very mundane things that, that the community needs. So uh, laundry, helping prepare the next meal. Uh, this time of year, a lot of raking leaves, uh, splitting wood for the winter time, that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> discussion is a very important aspect of, of what happens at Labrie. We, we say that we, our, our job as workers is to try to make Labrie a safe place for people to ask unsafe questions. What that means is that uh, many people, uh, whether they're from church backgrounds uh, or not, haven't had a safe place to ask difficult questions or to voice doubts that are very real to them. And that usually is pretty destructive because doubts tend to get bigger the longer we ignore them. And Labrie is, is really uh, intentionally trying to make a, a context in which people can be really honest about what they think or really honest about the questions they have. And one of the contexts in which that happens is just around the meal table. We have a lot of uh, discussions with the whole group around food. Uh, food is actually a very wonderful thing for all kinds of reasons, but uh, very often we open up and say what we think a little bit more easily when we're eating together. And we've, we've found that to be true. So uh, <clears throat> people come from all different kinds of beliefs. Some people are Christian, some people are not, but we try to make it a safe place for people to ask and say what they really, really think. And we certainly present a Christian worldview. We try to tell people what we think is the truth. If, if, we, if we feel like we have an answer to their questions, we, we, we're not shy about that. But also, we, we are committed not to just indoctrinate people and tell them what they have to think, because many, many times people have come from situations like that. Uh, who comes to Labrie and why? Uh, we have an 18-year-old lower limit. So you have to be at least 18 to be there. And there's no upper age limit. I was reminded by somebody in the first service, I need to say that. There's no upper age limit for, <laughs> for people coming to Labrie. We, this last term, we had a bunch of people in their 20s and then a couple of people in their 60s and 70s. And it was wonderful to have that intergenerational kind of combination. Uh, it's really not much of a strict screening process for who comes. You have to be at least 18 years old and you have to want to be there. Uh, you have to be willing to take important ideas seriously and to take other, people, other people's perspectives seriously. And that's about it. So uh, usually there's a huge diversity of people who come any given term with questions that vary widely too. So some people, some people come with very fundamental questions. Uh, is God even real? How can I take the Bible seriously? Uh, how am I supposed to read the Bible today, uh, given that all the other voices that are ex trying to explain reality to me? Um, is prayer real, or am I just talking to myself? Uh, some people come with doubts about the goodness of God based on their own experiences in life. So it's not, just, it's, it's not just a place where people think intellectual thoughts. It's a place where people are dealing with their real life situations and trying to, to figure out uh, what the Christian faith has to offer them. Uh, some people come who, are, who have a strong faith and just need time to, to reflect and read the Bible and pray and do it in the context of community. A lot of people come with questions about guidance and vocation. So what, what am I supposed to do with my life and how would I know what God wants me to do with my life? Uh, very practical questions. So uh, one of the things that makes Labrie unique is that this happens in the context of a home and a community. It's not an academic institution where you're in class, though there are lectures and there's a lot of content presented to our students, but it all happens in the context of life together where you can see the reality of these ideas expressed or not. They have to be embodied. I think for, for many people today, they want to see ideas lived out in order to really put their trust in them. And Labrie, from the very beginning, has tried to do that. Francis and Edith Schaefer were committed to demonstrating the reality of the Holy Spirit and of prayer. And the way they chose to demonstrate that was to cut themselves off from their financial support from this country and to pray that God would provide them with the funds and the guidance for what they were supposed to do as missionaries in Switzerland. And uh, they believe if we're trying to tell the world that the Holy Spirit is real and prayer is real, the world deserves to see people living as if that was really true, which means living in a fairly risky way, I think. 
Uh, and that's, Labrie has kept that principle ever since. So we don't actually fundraise. We pray that God would su supply our needs. We pray that God would send students to us. Uh, so we don't spend a lot of time running around advertising for students. Uh, but we pray that God would send the people that he's choosing to send to us. And that's one area that, that I would love to, uh, to welcome you into, to pray for us, um, to be part of our wider praying family, because we depend on prayer and God's answering of it. Um, another way you can get involved is to come on our Friday nights when we're, we'll start up our term again. We're on sabbatical right now. We'll start up our term in the new year, so starting in the first week of January. We'll start having lectures every Friday night, which is a great way to, to become introduced to Labrie and see what kind of a thing Labrie is. Uh, and uh, I have, I'll have a mailing list out here after the service if you want to sign up and get an email list of, um, we'll send you emails when we have our lecture schedule ready so you can be updated as to that. You can talk to people in this church that know about Labrie. Uh, I'm looking at Ross and Marty Coleman right there who have been good friends of Labrie for many years and they can, they can tell you uh, many things about Labrie. And uh, please just hold us up in your prayers. Pray for students. Pray for the people who come, that God would meet them there. Pray for more people to come. And pray that God would continue to sustain us. Thank you very much. Should I stay up here? No. Okay. I'll stay. Thanks so much. We're going to pray for Ben and for Kayla and... Uh, for the ministry with Labrie, we're also going to be praying for uh, two other mission organizations. We'll be praying for uh, the Operation Shoebox and Samaritan's Purse, and then also for uh, the Brazil Inland Mission with the Thompsons. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of Labrie in Southboro, and uh, we just thank you. Uh, that we can support uh, as, as part of our missions budget uh, this uh, wonderful uh, ministry for those that are seekers and, and seeking to, to find answers uh, to life and a safe a shelter where they can, uh, they can just ask their questions in a nice uh, home environment in a, in a safe place. Uh, and I thank you that there are people there ready to, to answer uh, from, the, from a biblical worldview, the answer to truth and, and does God answer prayer and is God a good God or is God capricious? Is God a loving God? Is he forgiving? Is he God of grace? Uh, and, and why is it that I face these, these things in, in this world? And so many other questions that people may wrestle with. We thank you they can go. And so we pray, Lord, uh, for this faith-based uh, mission for, for financial provision. Thank you for our part, but we pray you raise up new supporters, uh, new churches that will partner together with Labrie uh, for, for, the, for the kingdom of God. And we pray also for uh, our prayers that it would not be just uh, once a year in a missions conference and, and a pastoral prayer that we pray for Labrie, but it's a growing movement within our congregation on a regular, consistent prayer uh, for this ministry. We do pray that you'd bring people uh, to, uh, to Labrie, that they have a full house of 18 to 20 people. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, give strength uh, to the workers those that are working hard and laboring, and we pray that you would care for them, uh, for worthy as the worker in, in, in your vineyard, uh, worthy of, their, of hire. So we pray your blessing there. And Father, we pray secondly for uh, this Operation Chewbox. We thank you, Father, that we can uh, work together uh, yet again in providing in a very tangible way uh, this gift to, to children around the world that, uh, that we may never, never meet in this life. But children that are in places of great risk and poverty, uh, oftentimes a, a case of a result of war and tribalism. And Father, for those in remote parts of the world as well, that they have great need for simple things like a toothbrush and, and soap and uh, a pair of shoes or um, a, a toy or something that would show them that God's, God's alive and God loves them. 
and that people from somewhere around the world have taken the time to put together this shoebox uh, to, to, to show the love of Jesus for a child. So we pray your blessing, Lord, on Samaritan's Purse. Thank you we could support their ministry through a very nice large donation towards the hurricane relief in Texas. And we ask your blessing upon this new initiative. And Father, we also uh, pray, Lord, for the work of Brazil Inland Mission with David and Debbie Thompson. We do pray for the remodeling of the Urbis One Bible Congregational Church, uh, this ongoing ministry for a number of months now, and the pray for their son, Jonathan, that has had a, a huge impact on this work. We pray for the, the new semester of the Bible College as David teaches world missions to a class of 12 students. We pray for the various satellite schools uh, and particularly as David teaches a survey of Bible doctrine to 27 uh, students. And we ask that you'd uh, bless them. Pray for Debbie as she teaches Sunday school uh, women's class and helps with various activities of the ladies group. And we pray for Debbie as she begins teaching this fall. Uh, their son Jonathan will be uh, a senior in high school. We pray, Lord, for that, that homeschooling that takes place there. And pray for the, the, this uh, ongoing relationship that David has had with uh, Pastor Ramon and a two-year process of mentoring and uh, preparing him to take over the church plant. And I pray uh, for David that just like a, a John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus, that David would decrease as Ramon increases as the pastor of that new work. And finally, we pray for the new Christian grade school that it was inaugurated last month with David's mom, Alice, present. Uh, we pray for the classes that begin this February in 2018. Father, thank you for these missionaries. And thank you for this Missions Emphasis Month that each Sunday during this month we could pray for different missionaries, whether they're uh, down the street or around the world that your kingdom work would be advanced as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Hear us now as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as the children come up getting ready to sing our special offertory music, I'd like to read a scripture from John chapter 8 and verse 12. They'll be singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine and, uh, and give me oil, and, some, and so get ready for that. But hear this scripture from John 8 and verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As they come up and they sing about uh, that light, uh, may we just glorify God in our giving, for our giving helps to bring the light of Jesus Christ around the world.
If you wouldn't mind standing up, and we're going to say a prayer to thank God for the offering right now. Well done. Great job. Mark, if you would, please. Father, we just bless your name that you are the light of the world, and we thank you, Lord, that you have shown that light into the darkness. Lord, uh, we just ask that you would take what you have blended, blessed us with, this, this abundance, and that you would use it for your glory, Lord. We thank you, Lord. It would have been enough if you had just given your son to us, but you give us so much more, so much more grace in him. We thank you, Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our children are dismissed for children's time and kinder time, and Joe Irvin will be in the foyer. If you need help on where to go, he will take you to the right spot. So children are dismissed for kinder time and children's time. What a blessing to hear those children sing. Oh. <laughs> Good morning. Beautiful morning it is. God has blessed us with such a gorgeous fall day oh. and weekend. Well, please join me. Um, it's a privilege to read God's word this morning. And uh, if you could join me for our Old Testament reading. Um, the first reading is 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. And it can be found in your pew Bible on page 483. David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Mekir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So, the, so King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Mekir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of David, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Miss Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for and Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth <laughs> grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. 
Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> the, the gospel reading is um, from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And our New Testament reading is from the book of James, our friend James, um, chapter 2 verses 1 through 13, and it can be found in your pew Bible on page 1,881. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Well, as we uh, continue in our series of the book of James, um, we have an outline for you today in your uh, bulletin, pages six and seven. And if you'll see after the conclusion, there's a spot for three things there, my takeaways. So hopefully the Lord will speak to you and say, this is a takeaway I want to, to take home and put into practice. So uh, you may want to, Think about that as we move through this and to write those down as God so inspires you. Well, let's pray as we begin our, our sermon. Father, thank you so much for your living word today and ask that your spirit would anoint my lips and as your truth is proclaimed. But Lord, we pray that we be hearers and doers of your word. Put it into action. We, we want to be wise men and women uh, that base our lives upon the firm foundation of Scripture. So help us to understand it, but help us to also put it into practice. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. When I was preparing this message, 
uh, called Rich and Poor Together in the Kingdom of God, I began reflecting upon this message on favoritism and prejudice. And I began to say, how many times have I preached on favoritism or prejudice in my life? And I, I have to say, less than one time, all right? So I said, really? Really? It's about time that I preach on this very needed topic. Well, I heard a pastor one day who dressed up uh, as a homeless man. And he came into the church, and he had the, the rags on that he was wearing. And as he was coming, he, he had some of the odor of uh, being out on the streets for some time. And he didn't shave and had his hair kind of a mess. And he kind of came in to see how the congregation would welcome him or not. And uh, he was... He, uh, he was not surprised. Some people uh, kind of recoiled a bit when they, they smelled him and saw him. And others, uh, to his delight, began to, uh, to actually welcome him into the church and say, why don't you sit so-and-so or sit with us? And then after that, he went to the pulpit and said, I'm actually your pastor and I'm going to talk about this. So I thought about doing that for you guys today, but... I chickened out, so I had to shave and get cleaned up for you uh, this morning. Well, the Bible says in James, my brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. If a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourself, become judges with evil thoughts? And so what we're looking at here from God's word on favoritism is not only just a small matter. The Bible says that you would, be, uh, you would have uh, evil thoughts. And, uh, and so it is something we need to really examine our own hearts to say, Lord, show me if there is partiality or prejudice within me that I may repent of this sin, that I may embrace fully uh, you as my Lord and Savior. So in the first four verses of our text from James, we see the sins of favoritism and prejudice are being addressed. Special partiality is being given to the rich here in this first century church. Uh, it's also condemned elsewhere in Scripture. We see it in the book of Romans chapter 2. God's word assures us that God will render to each person according to his or her works, either eternal life or wrath or fury, Jew and Gentile alike. With God there's no partiality, whether you're Jew or Gentile, he will bless you or he will judge you. God shows no favoritism. Then in Ephesians 6, we, we read a similar thing. It says, God's words assures us that God will reward his faithful servants, whether bond servant or free, for with God there's no partiality with him. There's no favoritism. So for the slave or the free, God is not impartial here. He will bless or he will judge. And God shows no partiality. Then in Colossians 3, God's word assures us, everyone, male and female, wives and children, do your work heartily for the Lord, knowing that you'll receive the reward, and the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he or she has done. For with God, there's no favoritism. There it is again. And for the fourth time we see in James, he mentions the same thing. And he mentions about this practice of giving a, an ear to those who are wealthy in the church and say, you have special favor here, special clout, but for those with modest incomes or even the poor are minimized. And he says, this is wrong, this is sinful, and the church needs to repent. Well, this was written back in the first century. So I look back over the history of the church since then and take a kind of a, like a report card. How has the church done over the years? Would you give it a passing grade or a failing grade? I would give it a failing grade. A failing grade over the course of the years. Why, do you, why would I say that? Well, 
If you study congregationalism here in America, the original church, what they would do is you would have a pew and a little door on the pew, and that'd be a family pew. And you would rent it out. And the, and the closer you were to the, to the front, where, as it were, the more expensive the pew. And you could decorate the pew, put little doilies there, little pillows and, and all kind of things. And make it your own. And people would kind of kind of deck it out and say, wow, you can tell who sits in this pew. It's a person of great influence and money. And those of the people that didn't have the money, they were relegated to some place in the peanut gallery, all right, somewhere, somewhere a little further away that the rent for the pew was less. Well, the same thing is true if you try to get tickets for the Patriots game, I understand. All right? The closer you are to the field, the better the view, but the more expensive the price. Or if you go to the theater, it's the same thing, isn't it? Wherever you may go. Well, imagine now, this is the way the world would do it. Imagine the church would say, this is what we're going to do. And uh, they would actually rent them out. Now, don't get nervous. I'm not thinking about starting to turn back the, the clock, go back to the good old days, because that was not a practice that was the good old days. It was wrong. Even in the 19th century in mill towns in Massachusetts, in Upton, in Uxbridge, and in Douglas, and Sutton, and other communities like that in, in the Blackstone Valley, woolen mills came up. And what happened is the people worked in the woolen mills or, or, or in the cotton mills, whatever it was. And who was the person that lived in the big house up on the hill with a big mansion? It wasn't Labrie, all right, right? It was the mill owner. And what they would do, I, and I wrote a, a, a small booklet on the history of a church in Douglas, 250 years, so I kind of researched this a bit to see the history of the church in, in New England. And what they would do in this one church was they would wait till Mrs. So-and-so, who was the mill owner's wife, would come in, and she would sit in a certain seat, and after she sat, you could begin the service. Imagine. Imagine you'd have to wait until a person of influence and wealth was there before you could worship God. Would that please the Lord? That's the way it was done. Then please God. It's not consistent with the scripture, is it? Not consistent at all about how we are to, to worship. And so we see this. More recently in the 1960s, Martin Luther King Jr. said in his battle for civil rights and the end of segregation in America, said Sunday morning in the churches across America is the most segregated hour of the week. He was right. And so we see this, this treatment of, of prejudice and partiality uh, for the color of someone's skin or their economic situation or the way that they're dressed or their education or whatever the case may be is, is, is an abomination to God. And so as, as I go through this text on James, I say, well, you know, that's something they dealt with back then, but that doesn't really deal with us today. Would you agree? is something that we all must look at as well. Well, my view of heaven will be vastly different than, than what much of what we experience in worship here. There in heaven, rich and poor, black and white, educated and uneducated, people from every nation, tribe, language, and world, uh, tribe, all together worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way heaven will be like. And so we find that uh, James addresses the church down through the ages, including us today. Say, so don't show partiality. Don't show favoritism to those with, with wearing many gold rings. And don't tell the man dressed in shabby clothing to sit off to the side, uh, to be minimized or devalued because they don't have the financial means that you do. Well, the minimizing and devaluing the poor is a sin to be repented of. The sin of favoritism reflects evil thoughts of judging wrongly. Now, judging a person 
by external impressions and preconceived prejudices so as to declare a verdict of worth or value is condemned by Jesus. Now, sometimes I like to experiment. And I go into uh, uh, one of the big box stores and I go shopping for some things, the house, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll look kind of a mess. All right, won't comb my hair. Hope I don't run into any Trinity folks, embarrass them. Going in there, and I have my knee, holes in my knees, and I go in and just try to get what I need to get at the, at the box store for that. And, you know, many times people don't rush over to me to help me. It's like they kind of scurry away, and I'm there, what's going on? I'm the kind of guy that keeps you in business. You want people that are working, building things, right? And then, then I'll wear a suit. I'll wear a suit and tie, and I'll go in, you know, just because I was doing something, and I said, oh, i got to go back and get something. And oftentimes there's this hustle, and a person comes, can I help you, sir? I'm thinking like, yeah, sure. Just want to get some washers for from my house. Oh, let me show you where the washers are. You know, the little things you put around. The, the, I said, okay. And off they go. And anything else you need? Well, I need some string. Well, let me show you where the string is. And I'm thinking like, well, wait a minute. I didn't get this treatment the last time I was here. Why is that? People judge by appearance all the time. We as the church must not do that. We don't judge someone. We look at their hearts and we love them for who they are. In fact, God's word says in Genesis 1.26, we'll put that scripture up, gentlemen. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds and the heaven and over the livestock, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is a pivotal verse in scripture that shows us the value of a person because they're created in the image and the likeness of God, period, period. That person is a person of great value to, to be loved and cherished and listened to and embraced, you see, and this is so critical. God's people are called to not judge a person hypocritically. First take the beam out of our own eyes before we take the splinter out of a brother or sister's eyes. Now, in contrast, the call to not judge, the Christian is called to demonstrate discernment, a discerning heart, making wise distinctions between good and evil. Sometimes a person is clearly engaging in wrong, sinful behavior, and they snap back at us and say, now, now, now don't judge me. Don't judge me. This is what I'm going to do, and don't judge me about it. Well, what is a Christian to do? Are we just to be silent about some issues uh, of a chosen lifestyle for a Christ follower? Or are we to show discernment between good and evil? The Bible says this in Hebrews 5.14, that we are to demonstrate a discerning heart. It's a God-given mandate for the believer to make conscious, wise distinctions between good and evil. So we ought to show discernment, but not to judge. And there is a real important distinction there that we are to, to really understand. Well, here's, here's a point I'd like to make that uh, just really blew me out of the water. Uh, I don't claim it for my own. Someone else put it down, and I just uh, said, that's good. I want to use this one. People who are significant to God are often deemed insignificant to others. Would you agree with that? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Think about it. Yes. I believe it. It's true. Some, someone that would say, well, they're, they're kind of insignificant, or, well, I don't have to listen to them, or, well, you know, they haven't been here long enough to really hear what they have to say, and, or, or they're too young, or, or, or they're, not, they're from a different part of town, or whatever. Just say, no, no, that's not the way God sees it. People who are significant to God are often deemed insignificant to others. For example, in Scripture, 1 Samuel 16, Samuel was led by God to the family of Jesse to select God's appointed king of Israel. And so they had the parading of all the boys uh, uh, by Samuel. And along comes uh, uh, Eliab. 
Surely he's the guy. You know, built like a T-square probably, and tall and you know, handsome and rugged looking. And he's like, this is the guy. I said, no, no, he's not the guy. All right, get the next son. And Abinadab, he's certainly pretty good. He comes across, nope, he's not the one. How about Sharma? Nope, he's not the one either. And then seven sons come parading across, and, 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 it, and uh, God says to Samuel, none of those are the ones I've chosen to be the next king. I've got someone else in mind. So he says, is there another boy? Are we, <laughs> I you got a lot of them, but are you, are you missing one here? Well, yeah, that, uh, that's David. You know, he's a little guy. He, he's out watching the sheep. I mean, insignificant. He's really not all that important. We got, we got seven to choose from here. One, this is the cream of the crop. Well, why, why wait for the runt, right? Now, I, I'm adding a little bit to what Scripture says here now. <laughs> Those of you that are Bible scholars to say, wait a minute, I don't read that in my Bible. You're right. But the concept is there. The concept is there. And then along he comes, and God says, that's the man. I choose David because man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. That's the way we are to be, isn't it, as Christians? Look at a person's heart. Love them. See them a person of great value. And don't judge a person by their outward appearance. Well, our second major point goes on for chapters five to, uh, verses 5 to 7. The poor in the world chosen by God are, to, are rich in faith. The poor and the rich are both heirs of God and his kingdom. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those who love him? Heirs of the kingdom. Now, I love this little story that was read about Mephibosheth. I'm going to say it once. I don't want to say it two times. I'll be like Sally after a while. Get, I'll, I'll be, uh, won't be able to speak Mephibosheth. Well, here he is. Mephibosheth is just a poor man. And, uh, and David says, I want you to sit at my table, the king's table. Imagine that. Now, this is a picture of the king's table of the king of kings, Jesus Christ. And you and I are all the Mephibosheths. We are the poor. We are the, the crippled. We are the ones that, that, that desperately don't deserve to be at the king of kings table. And he says, come, feast at my table. All of you, repent of your sins. Come, you are welcome to be at my table. It's a great peach picture of rich and poor feasting together at the, the table of the king. Jesus said this in Luke 14. He said to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you to return to be repaid. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And so this is God's holy economy. The kingdom of God is given to those who love him. And in fact, Revelation 5 says this, and they sang a new song in heaven saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain, Jesus. By your blood you are ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to God and they shall reign on the earth. Next week we celebrate the great Reformation. And one of the great hallmarks of the Reformation is the priesthood of all believers. Imagine now, all believers are priests and can come together. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God from people, every tribe and nation. We've got a number of flags up here. It's just representative, really, of all the nations of the world. And, uh, and imagine what that will be like. That will be like a great marriage supper of the Lamb. Isaiah says this, he calls all to come, including the poor, the needy, delight yourself in the rich goodness of the Lord. He said, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend money for 
that which is not bread and your labor for that which is not satisfied. Listen, diligent to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. The kingdom of God is given to those who love him. That's God's economy. The call to not dishonor the poor is contrasted with the riches oppression of the poor. Listen to what James says in, in the next uh, verses. Verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? He says, now, let's use common sense now. These people that you are honoring coming in with all the wealth, and you say, you know, we want to listen to you. We want to give you the best seats. We want to listen. These are the people that are oppressing you or taking you to court, taking you to the cleaners. Even from a common sense perspective, does it make sense to elevate them above others? No, not at all. Not at all. God wants us to value people, to, to not dishonor the poor or, or uh, contrasted with the oppression of the poor. Well, the third point I'd like to make is the law of God called to love one's neighbor as oneself in verses 8 to 13. Favoritism is breaking the law of God to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he goes on to mention a number of other big commands from the Ten Commandments. Are you familiar with the Ten Commandments? Anybody out? You, yes? You familiar with the Ten Commandments? All right. Is that on your top ten list? All right. Well, if you're unfamiliar with them, you can read about them in Exodus chapter 20, listed there. there. But two of those Ten Commandments are murder and adultery. You should not murder, you should not commit adultery. And the Jews, at this time, Jewish believers, they were all Jews that became Christians at the first part of the church. They knew the Ten Commandments. So when he said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, he said, we know it. We've heard it. We've heard it before. We understand. And he says, partiality, the showing partiality to the rich, guess what? It's in the same category. Wait a minute, that wasn't one of the top ten. Guess what? This is a command of God. Don't do it. If you break one, you've broke them all. And that includes this one of showing partiality or favoritism. Well, what do we say in conclusion then? I'd like to wrap it up with this. The high call for the Christ follower is to live our lives differently than the world. Live differently than the world. How? Let scripture be your standard, not your own thoughts and emotions and feelings and prejudices and whatever else, the way you were raised. No, let scripture be the standard. Number two, let love be your law. Number three, let no prejudice or favoritism remain in your life. If that is part of your life, get rid of it. Repent. Ask God to cleanse you and change you, and he will. And number four, let mercy be your message. Let mercy be your message. Let's just bow our hearts together. And I'd like you to pray silently uh, for the first minute things that maybe God kind of kind of pricked your heart a little bit. You feel a little uncomfortable. You felt challenged. Uh, you felt a godly rebuke. You felt there's something that God wants to do in you or change in you. Just commit that to God in prayer and just to pray. And uh, then we'll conclude with our unison prayer together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, hear us as we now pray together this prayer in unison. Heavenly and Holy Father, we thank you for your living word today, which calls us to repent 
of the sins of prejudice and favoritism and embrace each person in the body of Christ fully as our brothers and sisters in Christ and join heirs of the kingdom of God. Grant unto us hearts and minds which not only see the value of all people created in the image and likeness of God, but demonstrate a faith which is genuine by obedience to your holy commands in our lives as Christ followers. Lord, may your scripture be the standard for our lives. May love be the law of our hearts. May no prejudice or favoritism remain in our lives. May mercy be our message, not favoritism and prejudice. Even as we look forward to that day in heaven where we will feast together at your holy table with people from every tribe and nation who love you and have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. For he asks all these things in Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, thanks for coming today. I wanted to uh, just look around the room here, and there's a lot of people that are new within the last three months. So you may want to rub shoulders with one another and say, you know, I'm so-and-so. Nice to have you here. If you're able to do that, that would be awesome. And uh, something that we're, we have here at Trinity for a number of years coming up is a Thanksgiving dinner for people that's free. And uh, it's a great opportunity to put into practice some of the stuff we are teaching today about who's at the table. And uh, maybe you want to you participate in serving. Maybe you want to sit together and invite them to come afterwards to the testimony time here on that Thanksgiving uh, day before Thanksgiving. Well, receive the benediction, and I'll be out in the foyer to greet you over by the welcome station, and, our, and one of the elders will be over at the door to greet you as you leave. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all those whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen.